Hello and welcome to the Car Kerala channel. Welcome back to part 2 of the technical review of Toyota's new engine, the Dynamic Force engine. In today's video, we're going to be focusing on the major change in this engine, which is the variable valve timing. I'm also going to give you guys some DIY tips and tricks on this engine. And we're going to go over the whole engine, show you where all the parts that we've talked about in part 1 and part 2 are on this engine. If you missed part 1, I will leave it right here or it'll also be in the description of this video. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. And without further ado, let's dig right into it. Let's talk about variable valve timing. And this is likely one of the most just crazy advancement in this engine. So variable valve timing, it just changes the valve timing in the olden, not olden days that this engine makes a few years ago, look like the olden days. It used to use oil pressure. And you remember some Toyota models have issues with rattle and cold startup because there's a little gear where on the end of the camshaft and that gear has a mesh inside of it that can change the timing and things are beautiful. If you advance the timing, you get more power. If you retire the timing, things calm down and go back and you get, you want both because we're not going to get too much into it because then we'll, me and you will be lost in a giant engineering fiasco. But let's keep Keeping this simple, like this series, on the exhaust side of this engine, things are very conventional. It uses oil pressure to change the timing. It changes it up to 41 degrees, which that just seems like a number I'm throwing there, but it can advance and retard the time based on the need and to give you more power, better fuel economy, depends on how you're driving. Now the intake side is when things go crazy. Is, is the word for it because it can change the timing 70 degrees that is ladies and gentlemen is a lot that is just all new and that is something crazy so how it achieves that it doesn't use oil pressure at all it, oil has nothing to do with the intake side it uses a german looking overcomplicated Made by Toyota, so it's probably super reliable. Motor, electrical motor. So the intake gear has a little mechanism or a little, uh, best way to describe it is a little transmission, if you would. And that motor is connected to it. That motor, and this is gonna sound scary, that motor is always spinning the speed of the camshaft. So, Let's say you want base timing. You want no advance, no retard. It's gonna run at the speed of the camshaft. So now the gear is spinning the same speed as the camshaft. When it wants to advance the timing, it's gonna send a signal to that motor to speed up. It's gonna start increasing its speed faster than the camshaft. And now you have advanced timing. And when it wants to retard the timing, it's gonna slow down a little bit slower than the camshaft is going to turn that gear back and now it has retarded timing which is insane i mean just think of this there is an electric motor running the speed of the camshaft at all times all the time that this engine is running the camshaft the the uh that the little electric motor is such a little electrical motor it's not a huge guy it's running the speed of the camshaft that is just that is a very brave design because can you imagine how much development went to this motor to make it as reliable as the badge in front of this car? My hat goes to the people that designed this system and not only designed it in just, oh, here's my design, it's great, it's gonna break after a month and life is good. No, they made it and they put it in a production car that has the Toyota logo on it. That means this thing had to patch all their stringent reliability tests and it passed ladies and gentlemen this is marvels of engineering at at its finest right here this system gives the computer 
almost infinite control over what it can do. And that's how this engine can achieve the power level that it does and gets the gas mileage that it does, thanks to this system. Now, people will ask, well, wait a second. Even though it's a Toyota, when this thing has 300,000 miles, I mean, it's a motor, it has a life, it's gonna go out. Is everything just gonna blow up? No, they're very smart with that too. They figured, you know what? There's gonna be a point, 200, 300,000 miles, whatever the case may be, and that motor will fail. When it fails, it's gonna stop. And what's gonna happen is the timing, remember when it slows down that motor, slower than the camshaft, is gonna retard the timing. But when the motor stops, it's essentially slower. So it's gonna retard the timing, retard the timing until it reaches a mechanical stop. And now it's fully retard. The engine will go into limp mode and it's gonna be very low on power, but it'll still run and it's not gonna explode or nothing will happen. And actually from testing, when that motor, when you simply unplug that motor, it's gonna stop. It's just an electrical motor. You plug, unplug it. It's gonna make some rattling noise initially, which will, it's scary how it, I don't want to do it on this engine to show you because I don't want to push it. Nice people will lend me this car and I'm doing all this with it. But uh, it's going to back off the timing to fully retard it and it's going to go into limp mode. It'll make some rattling noises, but that's it. Nothing will blow up. Nothing will explode. So that's the fail safe of this system. They thought of everything in this one and We've had very little issues with this system so far, and I have no doubt this will be very reliable. And for the advantages that it has, it has infinite control over the timing. Let's talk about some DIY advice for this engine. Folks, I'm not gonna lie. This engine is not very DIY friendly, especially internally, and most people have complained, the DIY mechanics that ended up buying this car, or a car with this engine, if you would, they complain there's a lot of plastics. We're worried that all this is gonna break, and we remember the nightmares from some uh, manufacturers there that uh, use plastic everywhere. I'll be honest with you, I'm with you on this one. I don't like that they use a lot of plastic on this engine. I don't like that the valve cover is plastic, but I've taken these valve covers off. They seem well made. They're a little flimsy, but again, they're plastic. But the idea here is it's just a valve cover. Okay, breaks at 150,000 miles, well, replace it. It's not a big deal, and that's what they figured. We're putting this huge aluminum heavy piece and it's costing us a lot more and it's the same thing. It's not the end of the world if you have to replace a valve cover after 10 years or 150,000. Now they do use a lot of plastics in the coolant pipes, which is something that is questionable. I'll agree with you because plastic gets brittle with heat and it breaks. So generally today, when this engine is new, as of the date of filming this, this video, it's not a problem down the road, be careful with the plastic components, especially the coolant passages and, and the coolant pipes, if you would. Other DIY advice, please use Zero W16. I've already explained, but I must say it again. Another thing is, if you want to replace a PCV valve, uh, it's a little buried on this engine. It actually sits between the intake manifold and the cylinder head. You have to remove, there's no you can come underneath it. No, there's absolutely no way. You just pull the intake manifold and it'll be right there. So you have to remove the intake manifold to do the PCV valve, not a huge deal. One thing that I will mention that is very important. If you are replacing coolant on this engine, there are two things you need to know. Number one, this engine has a very complicated cooling system. There is a coolant hose on the EGR valve and I'll show you in the aerial view. You need to take that hose off before you fill the car with coolant. Take it off, fill it up until it comes out of this hose, then put it back in. When you start the car and when you're ready to bleed the coolant, you need to raise the engine RPM immediately to over 1500 and hold it. Do not keep going up and down. Remember, we have an electric water pump. Remember, we have the, the valves that could be closing circuits to different places. So the engineers thought of this and when you raise the engine RPM to over 1500 and hold it there at idle when the car is running, it's gonna pick on that and it's gonna enter a coolant fill mode or it's, it's a mode that's designed to 
for service. So it, what it will do is it will run the, the electric water pump at full speed. It's gonna open all the valves, cancel all this fancy stuff, because it's gonna enter a mode where you're, it's designed to fill the coolant. It will open all the passages. It'll make bleeding the coolant much easier, more efficient. Otherwise, it's not gonna happen and you're gonna have problems. So you gotta research and look into this one. And basically, you know the basic idea, but don't just replace coolant, fill it up and call it a day like any other car. Remember, electric water pump, valves, you gotta pay attention to this one. Let's start our aerial view. So here's that intake motor that I told you about. Look how small this guy is. Amazing. And behind this cover is the actuator for, for the conventional one on the exhaust side. And here's the water pump, the electric water pump. I'll use my little light right, right here. See how the belt doesn't go to it? Going back, here's the intake manifold. Here's your EGR passage. We'll get to the EGR in a second. Here are your four port injectors, not the direct injectors. And underneath the intakes, actually the direct injectors, I can't really get access to them without removing the intake, but you get the idea, they're down there, they spray directly into the, into the engine. Going up, you see right here, this is a fuel line. See, it's going to the port injectors. Then we're gonna follow this fuel line. It's gonna come right here and it's gonna split. Do you see the split? This side goes to the, comes from the fuel pump in the tank. This is a, the direct injection fuel pump. It gets gas right here. And then do you see the solid metal line that runs across here? And then it goes down below to the direct injectors. This is your fuel delivery pipe. This has high pressure. One precaution, never take this nut out because you have high pressure fuel right there. Now, coming back on this side, here's your EGR valve. And here is that coolant pipe, that, that coolant hose that I told you to remove when you bleed the coolant. And here's the rest of the EGR system. Here's the cooler right here. And then it goes back. Here's a better shot of that coolant cooler for the EGR. And then here's your vacuum pump. Let me see if I can get the camera. So here's your vacuum pump. Right there, this little behemoth of a component. These two coolant hoses that you see right here, these are the valves for the cooling system that we talked about. Here's a view with everything removed. Here's that, uh, this, is, this is a 2020 Camry. This is actually the eight-speed transmission right there. And ladies and gentlemen, I wanna show you one more guy before we wrap this up. Meet the hero that does all of this. This guy right here. This is the engine computer. You notice how small it is, but it has these giant heat sinks. This is the brain of everything. Look how small it is. They keep getting smaller and smaller. This is the brain of the operation. This controls everything in this engine. Isn't it amazing how, how such a small component does so much in this car? I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope if you own a car that has this engine or you're planning to buy one, I hope you learned something about this engine that you didn't know. This is a really cool engine. I have no doubt that this engine will be very reliable. We have very little issues in the very early years. Most of them were covered by warranty. So far, we don't have anything chronic. As long as the right maintenance is done, especially, and I, I'm so sorry that I said this multiple times, but I must say it one last time. Please use Zero W16 on this engine. Don't overthink it. Don't think you're gonna cause harm. Regardless of what your climate is, use Zero W16 and you should have no issues. If you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel. If you're not a subscriber, check out some of my other videos. Thank you so much for watching this video. May the Lord bless you and keep you and you have a wonderful day.